Hello everyone, my name is Roger Shimkowski and I am a solutions engineer here at SnapLogic. Today I'm going to provide a demonstration of how to process a CSV file from an API call. Uh, from a SnapLogic perspective, we're going to take a look at the design of the pipeline itself, the trigger task that is used to provide the URLs and the bearer token for the pipeline to be called as an API request. We'll take a look at the sample data that we're going to send over. We will make the HTTP POST request. I will be using a utility called PAW. You could use Postman, Curl. You could use your own API, your own application. Anything that can make an HTTP POST request can call this and submit the file. After the request is complete, we will take a look at the pipeline execution in the dashboard. And then at the very end, we'll take a look and make sure the files are where we think they were going to go and with the data that we expected. So this is the SnapLogic interface. This is the pipeline that I have designed for this demonstration. On the left-hand side, you'll see that our open input for where the HTTP POST request will bring the data in is going to be a CSV parser snap. Uh, this is a default snap, so I'm not going to dig into it. Uh, the mapper snap is what we will be talking about a little bit more. And you can kind of see what we have set up here as far as our mappings and transformations. Before we dig into each of those, let me just pull up this sample data file. So this is what we're going to be pulling over. We've only got four records in here along with headers. And we've got the date, the status, the salesperson, the buyer, the invoice amount, and the state where the request originated. So if we come back in here to the mapper snap, you can see that buyer and date are moving straight over. Now if I had designed it like this and I wanted to make a quick change, for example, I want to have date be first, I can just drag it like that. This third one, what we're doing here is we're actually not taking data out of the file, but I'm going to add a date stamp. The date now function will take the current timestamp of the execution node where the pipeline is running, and it will add that to our result as a date received. And I'm actually going to move that up so that it's at the second column. Um, the next field that has any sort of transformation is going to be this, where we are going to replace the word processing with the word submitted. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because the destination system that I have in mind does not accept the word processing. It's not a valid status. Uh, we're only going to take the statuses of accepted, rejected, and submitted. So I need to change processing from my clients into submitted. The next modification or addition that we're making is we're going to add a new column as well here for state taxes, sales tax. Uh, so basically, if the state is not California, or Colorado, we're going to add 10%. If it is California or Colorado, we'll do 15%. So that's the mapper. This is where our transformation to mapping will happen. After the mapper snap, we're going to move into this copy snap, and we're going to make basically a hard copy of the data. We're going to flow one copy to this JSON formatter. This is another snap that is set up as default. I haven't changed anything. And this is necessary so that we can get the binary output of the data before we put it into a binary input base snap like the file writer. The second branch of our copy is going to run this down to a Google worksheet writer. And I've applied my spreadsheet name and my worksheet name. And the only other change made here is that I've selected to overwrite the worksheet if it already exists. Now I want to take a look at the file writer real quick and talk about one thing I did here. I have the file name set as an expression, and you'll see that I have this underscore and then file name. Where that is going to come from is if I click on pipeline properties up here, you can see that I have a parameter named file name, and the default value is going to be demo csv.csv. This will allow customers to pass file name as a query parameter, and we would capture that and it would replace whatever the default value is. And the underscores only need in these expression toggle fields when you want to translate the file name into the value. All right, so now that we've taken a look at the data in the pipeline, let's go take a look at, real quick here, how we would have created this as a task. So I've already created this as a task, so I won't flow all the way through, but this is the icon that we would click. And you can see what's going to come up is basically going to tell us this is the name, the suggested name. Uh, really, it's just the pipeline name with the word task appended. We're going to have the pipeline. 
our parameters are here, so we could also override the parameters at the task level. The snaplex, where we will let it, the pipeline to run. Uh, we are going to determine that this is a triggered task. This is what's going to create the URL for us to call. It'll also create an auth bearer token. Uh, scheduled is pretty self-explanatory, and then Alter is a low latency pipeline that would also have a URL to call. Uh, for my case, I did not set a timeout. Um, in my task. Now that you've seen this, let me hop over to my task so I can show you. So this is my task. I've already filtered down the name. So just clicking on the task name will open the field that is the result of going through that wizard I was just showing you. Uh, but in this case, here's my bearer token. I did not want to check this option because in this scenario, I might have multiple clients trying to send CSV files at the same time. So I don't want to block the second or third person if there's one already executing. I want to be able to accept all of them. Uh, I'm not in debug mode right now, so I'm not worried about recording the next five triggers. Uh, I could put my email address or a support email address or a DevOps email address, anybody here who would be responsible for managing the task functionality and or who might want to know if there's a failure. And this would be a total timeout. So for example, if both of the folks submitting files, their files are completing in 10, 30 seconds or less, uh, but you have one person who keeps trying to send a large file, right? You might want to set a timeout of something like one minute. That way you're not going to have the task running forever if a large, super large file is submitted. For this scenario, timeouts can be used other ways for other scenarios. All right, so let me close this down real quick, and I want to show at the end of the name, there's this drop-down arrow as well, and I can click on that and view details. And this is where you can get the URLs to call the task. So this is the URL that I will be using for my demonstration. Again, you find the header token here that we're going to need for authorization. And then I want to point out very quickly that there are some on-premise URLs that you could use as well. Most common scenario that we see for triggered tasks is that uh, companies will set up a load balancer or some sort of public facing URL with their company domain name uh, or use their own API and then behind the scenes they will call these URLs uh, keeping the traffic all on their network. All right so from here we're going to jump over to the dashboard and you can see I have called this a couple times earlier today but right now I don't have any instances running so I'll just hit the one hour button just to refresh so we can see. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open PAW, and I'm going to fire off this request. Uh, you can see here the summary of the body and the headers. So this is a, just a standard post request that you could make from any other client. Postman, uh, you could make it from a scripting language like Python, you could do it from your own API. Anything that can make an HTTP post request, you could call this from. All right, so we finished, we got our 200. So if we go back over to the dashboard, we can see this is the pipeline. Uh, we can see this icon right here tells us that it was a triggered task. If I click that, it would take me back to the task itself. The username is always going to be the owner of the task. And then I can take a look here by clicking on started to see the statistics for the pipeline. So what this tells us is that we had a 234 byte file come in, just a single file. That file had four documents, header row is not included. And you can see how it flows through all the way through to Worksheet Writer, where the four rows are written. And then here in the JSON formatter, we take those four and we turn it back into one file. And that's what's written. So the last thing here is for me to, sorry, for in, in this part is to show you the pipeline parameters. So what we're looking at here, I didn't send a file name in my demonstration, so you won't find it. But when you're talking about an API call through SnapLogic, you will see that we have the ability to capture these additional fields. Uh, all you would need to do is add them as pipeline parameters and then you could capture these as well. All right, so the final thing is going to be taking a look at the file itself. So here we are, I've already filtered and you can see the timestamp just updated there. So this is the file that was written. And if I view this file, you can see that we have in JSON format, the same data, including our date received, so this was a, sorry about that. Date received is a timestamp that we created. You can see that we've added a sales tax and we can see that this is all in JSON format now. 
Now I'm going to pause the video for a moment and pull up the same document in Google Worksheet. Back and here is the Google Worksheet version of the data that came through. So we can see we've got the date, the date received, the buyer, salesperson status, and the sales tax, just as we would expect. Uh, that's it for this demonstration. Thank you for your time, and please enjoy the rest of your day.